Hey, everybody, and uh, welcome to our third edition of HackerCast. Um, I'm joined uh, again by Rob, who's back from uh, his trip to Japan. Uh, Rob, we did an episode without you um, on the Uber hack. Uh, so, we're going to talk about. <laughs> so it's been um, several months since the Equifax hack really um, you know, came out of the news, the Equifax breach. It was back in September, believe it or not. So you know, almost three months ago, um, the Equifax breach was was made public, um, and it's been one of the largest breach stories, not only for 2017 but for a, a lot of years, and you know, it's probably to come, and and a lot of years here um, um, that's that's passed. The sheer scope of the breach is unprecedented. You know, 145 million credit records stolen, um, really personal information that allows hackers to really gain control of your identity, identity, open credit accounts, you know, open mortgages, just a lots of crazy things they can do with that information. Um, and it was really at its heart, it was a vulnerability um, in struts um, that had been known about for, for quite some time. And so Rob actually had a chance to do some research on the struts vuln, and, and he's gonna tell us today about um, what that is and, and what to look for. Yeah, sure. I wanted to kind of demonstrate and just show uh, in some sort of simpler terms exactly how this thing works, uh, why it came about, and maybe it'll be useful for developers to think about how they're how they're developing things and people to think about how they're testing their software. Maybe um, you know what what to look for for the kinds of vulns that create an opportunity like this. Um, yeah. So you know, basically, uh, you know, just to dive into it, there's uh, a, an error message is really the core problem here. Um, so there's a, a certain error message that is exploitable that you can use uh, through a, a chain of attack to get remote code execution. Uh, but that error message is not by default visible. So I just wanted to kind of demonstrate, you know, how, how you can make this error message visible, how you can use it to actually get remote code execution. Uh, so we think of error messages as a great place to do reflection attacks like cross-site scripting or content spoofing, um, you know, us, old time web application people are used to those kind of things. We've seen them, we see them day in, day out every day. Um, but with uh, these kinds of attacks, we're starting to see much more commonly, you can get bigger deal attacks like remote code execution. Um, so I, I've seen some people refer to this, uh, because this is a, a problem related to OGNL, uh, I saw some people talking about this as being related to, um, you know, thinking about this as being a template injection. OGNL is actually not exactly a template language. Uh, it's instead an expression language, which is a little different and a little more dangerous. Uh, and you'll you'll see why as I as I demonstrate here uh, that an expression language really is is really not a good thing to let end users have control over. Um, so I'm going to try to share my screen here. You can let me know, Ryan, if it's successful. It looks good. We got it. All right. Cool. So this is a uh, this is just sort of a default Java application, uh, just to demonstrate the features of Struts. Uh, so so Struts two, you know, you can you can run this thing and, and see how Struts two works. So what we're really going to focus in on here is this uh, ability to upload a file. So if you say file upload, single file upload, I have to turn off my my burp here. Intercept is off. Okay. Do a good start. Oh, there it is. This took a while. So if I just choose a random file, upload it, give it a caption. Uh, this thing uploaded, right? So file upload sample. Here's the results. Congratulations, you just uploaded a file. It's now sitting in this location on the on the server. Uh, so the way the way this uh, the reason this is a problem, if we go and look in in Burp here, uh, for those who are not familiar, Burp's just a tool that's just capturing the requests so we can see them and manipulate them. Um, I'm going to send this over to Repeater so we can play around with it. So when using Repeater, um, you can basically see and and change uh, how the request was sent and see what the response is. So if I go ahead and send this send this request, it comes back. We can see uh, 
by using the render function, you can see that this is what we saw in the, in the web browser. It says, congratulations, you uploaded a file. Um, the pro so let's focus in a little bit here on the content type. So if we change the content type to something that it's not expecting, this whole long thing is the content type actually. Let's say we change the content type to, uh, you know, just foobar. Send it. Now the, the error message we get uh, was not that helpful. Really, this is just sort of the default error message for this particular application saying file can't be empty, caption can't be empty. Neither of those things were empty. This is just sort of a default error message. Um, but really, the, uh, the error message is being caused by the fact that there's, it's not really a multi-part form data. It's not the expected file type. Now, this, this error is being caught by the struts dispatcher. So the first thing that looks at a request when it comes in, the struts dispatcher looks at it and decides whether or not it's something it wants to actually do something with. Um, but the way it decides whether or not it's something good is it actually just looks to see whether or not it contains this string. So you can do something strange like adding in additional underscores and this is gonna still contain the string multi-part form data. So the dispatcher is gonna happily send it over to another framework called Jakarta which is the one that actually handles the file upload. So now Jakarta is the one that's actually has the issue here. So Jakarta has this, you see there's this additional error message now. The request doesn't contain a multi-part form data or multi-part mixed stream. Content type header is multi-part form data. So you can think about, you know, this looks like reflection, right? This is the value I just put in here. Now because it sanitizes and does a HTTP encoding and stuff, can't really use it for cross-site scripting or something, but it turns out this error message that we're looking at, this first bullet point, uh, this, this error message here, uh, the way that it's populating this data from the content type that I sent is with an expression in OGNL. And so it, this entire string is being evaluated for OGNL. Um, and OGNL works uh, nested. So because OGNL works nested, you can actually do OGNL in here and then that gets evaluated. So if I said something like this, um, for example, let's go ahead and put it in parentheses. Be useful in the future. Now, if we look at that error message again, it says the content type header is multi-part form data. That's clearly not what I put in. What I put in was this whole big thing, right? This whole thing is an OGNL expression, which is evaluating to multi-part form data. So, so now, now we're basically, you can kind of see now at this point that the, it's, it's not the error message the application wants to give you or that the Struts2 dispatcher wants to give you. That's the problem. It's from this, this other framework, Jakarta. And so to get there, we just have to make sure that our, our string somewhere in our content type has to have this expression somewhere in there. It has to say multi-part form data somewhere in it. It doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter if it's real or works. As long as that's in there anywhere, then we're going to hit the Jakarta error message instead. And that Jakarta error message is going to actually uh, give us our problems here. Uh, so we can, so the way OGNL works, you can just kind of string stuff together. So we can, we can look for, um, you know, we can look for something else here uh, just, to, just to make sure that we are really getting what we want. So let's just say member access, which is just a, a variable that OGNL has access to and can, can read. So let me go check this out. So your content type header is com.opensymphony, blah, 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 blah. So this is basically my, my, privilege, my privilege level in OGNL that you're operating at. Um, so, so basically right now, we've already kind of demonstrated that this is, this is OGNL at this point. I can write OGNL to do stuff. Now, because OGNL is not uh, just a template, OGNL is actually an expression language, I can change this. I can say, I don't want to have this access level. I want to have an access level to do whatever I want. So that's the next step. So I'm going to switch over to uh, text editor here, so you can kind of see. This is the next the next one I'm going to I'm going to demonstrate. And I, I broke 
I broke it up a little bit so it's easier to talk about what we're looking at here. Uh, so, so this first line, uh, you can see this is what I was talking about. It just has to have multi-part form data in there somewhere. It doesn't really matter. As long as it's in, in our injection somewhere, then we'll happily go through the dispatcher and get to the Jakarta. Um, the second one, we're just setting our member access to be the default member access for OGNL, um, which gives us the ability to access the java.ling.runtime. If we have java.ling.runtime, then we can, we can do an exec call, which lets us run basically bash commands. Um, so I'm gonna demonstrate that, but before I do, I think I'll just, just show uh, kind of the result we're expecting. Um, so if we look here, I'm in the test directory on the server itself. There's, there's nothing in there. Um, but the, what the command I'm going to run is to send, is to copy the Etsy password file and put it in the hack, uh, into the test directory under a file name hack. Um, this basically just demonstrates that you could do something like put something in the public HTML folder, or instead of running this copy command, you could easily, um, just have have the server curl down a script that you have or you know you, you could just install malware or try to disable certain firewall access or whatever um, whatever you want basically at that point it's just a just a bash script so if I run this one you know we're not expecting too much to happen here but you can see that what it what it actually uh, resolves to is that it, it turns into a process, right? So this is a java.lang.unix process, which is a good sign. So because a Unix process just ran, now if we look again, there's actually a file in here and it's the, the, the password file. So this is a, you know, just a, a demonstration that you can do stuff with it, but there's a, it's not that convenient of a way, right? You, you couldn't really see what you're doing um, so the next the next step up is to take the response and and be able to send that back to the to the browser right to be able to get the answer back from the web server and this is actually pretty easy to do so this is getting a little more complicated but most of this we've already seen right so we've already seen this multi-part form data we've already seen this member access which is giving ourselves better access so we're going to create a new process with the with the pro using the process builder we're going to run the similar command. We're just going to cat slash Etsy slash password. Uh, we're going to start that process. And then this response is just getting the response from struts two, the, the HTTP response that's going to go back to, in our case, burp. Um, and then we're going to use a utility to copy the output from our process to the HTTP response stream. And then we're going to flush it so that it actually runs and, and comes out. So um, if we, you know, if I just copy this here and use that as my content type. Now remember the, the stress dispatcher still thinks this whole thing is just a multi-part form data because it saw that somewhere in it and that's all it really cares about. I don't need two content types, just one will do. And so see what we get now on the right-hand side here in the response pane, this is actually the response of the command that we ran. So now you're starting to see how this could be easily exploitable by a hacker, right? You could just run any other command besides that file. You could run who am I, for example, which should tell you the user that the application is running under, in this case, root, hopefully not root in production. I don't know about Equifax, but, um, you know, so at this point you can just run commands and it's pretty easy to go from here to having a terminal, whatever uh, you want, you can basically just set up from this point once you can run commands. Does that make sense, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty scary to think that that's, that vulnerability itself was what was utilized to pull off one of the biggest breaches that we've ever seen. Um, pretty amazing to see that. So appreciate you going through that with us. Um, and, and just how simple it is to do. I mean, I know it wasn't simple to craft those requests, but um, you know, with a little bit of research, you can get a lot of great information out of that. Yeah, and I mean, so so I'm kind of actually making it more complicated than the attackers really needed to because I'm trying to demonstrate a little bit about how it works under the hood. Uh, but by the time these attacks happened, 
um, I think that this had already been out and been patched for months, right? So uh, we knew this was being actively exploited. Uh, this was, uh, you know, we people could see this happening. Uh, our peers at at, uh, at companies that monitor uh, intrusions actually knew that this vulnerability had been exploited at some other companies. So it, it was known that this was a, a real serious issue that you needed to patch. Uh, to patch, you basically just need to upgrade. That's a very simple patch um, to prevent this from happening. Um, but there's a but there's a lot of stuff that needs to get patched, right? That's a it's a full time job. Uh, you you need help if you're a big company with lots of software to know what needs to be patched and to keep it updated. Uh, and they just didn't. So. Uh, you know, there's much simpler ways to actually exploit this than doing it by hand, kind of the way I was demonstrating. You can just use, um, you know, uh, there's there's already pre-built Python scripts and stuff like that that'll get you command shell. Um, so there's they certainly didn't even have to do as much work as I did here uh, to exploit this. Really, you've got to keep, you know, your patches up to date. You've got to watch your um, all all the software you're using to build your software. Software these days, it's it's often said it's not really built, but assembled. Uh, it's true, right? This In this case, this problem, and everyone's kind of blaming struts for these kinds of issues that come up. But in many cases like this one, it's really a problem with Jakarta, which is something that struts uses, right? So it, everyone has this kind of a trickle down effect. One, one uh, you know, library that is used in a bunch of places has an issue suddenly everybody has this issue and everyone needs to patch. Uh, and once these kind of known issues get out there, it's so easy to just drive around the internet looking for people who have this issue and take advantage of it. So I think the, the moral of the story here is um, patch management is a big deal. Uh, it's difficult to do for sure because of just how many, you know, not only pieces of software we use, but all the different technologies that we use as well um, and how many different versions they're running. Um, and as we've seen in the past, there are vulnerable versions. There will be continue to be vulnerable versions out there and all new versions will eventually be vulnerable. So it is a full-time job. And it's something that all companies need to have is they need to have not only, you know, a person dedicated to doing this, but they also need to have the right software in place to be able to detect what they have and what's out of date. Um, so software composition analysis is becoming a big market. Um, and something that you know us at White Hat like like to do as well. I mean, that's part of our service suite is actually doing the the software composition analysis, which will show you you know what what frameworks you have that are out of date, what vulnerable versions there are. Um, so that's definitely something that you that you need to have, um, and something that you really should invest in both the the, the people resources as well as the, the automation and technology to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and. You know, once you once you have a tool like RSCA or you know some other tool that's going to tell you there's you know you have this issue, uh, you have to take it seriously. Uh, the, you have to take it seriously that that we are right now exploitable and these things are footholds, right? People don't uh, I think necessarily respect the the role that an application server can play in the overall security in the organization. Uh, I, I I doubt anybody over there at Equifax thought, okay, our, our front end website for this one particular function, uh, this thing has this, you know, needs to be upgraded. I better do that today or we're going to lose 145.5 records, right? They, you know, million records. They don't, they don't really equate to what a foothold in their network can really mean from an application server. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty astounding, I have to say, and and thank you, Rob, for showing us that. Um, you know, again, one of the one of the biggest breaches in history shown pretty simply in a, in a pretty short video. So, appreciate everybody for watching. Uh, Rob, thank you very much for for showing us that, and welcome back from Japan. Thank um, you. Thank you. We hope to have lots more videos coming soon. Um, if you liked the video, please feel free to uh, push that like button. Um, if you have any comments, please go ahead and put them in the comments. We'd love to respond to them. And uh, if you really enjoyed the video, please feel free to subscribe as well to this video. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, happy hacking and uh, have a happy holidays. Thanks, everybody.